did have an epiphany. Maybe not an epiphany, maybe epiphany is the wrong word. Um, you know how you last week were trying to convince me that um, a Google Murray Bookchin is a meme? Okay. meme? <laughs> I came up with my own version. Okay. It is Google Charles Dowden. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've realized that I've said that like five times to different people <laughs> recently. I'm like, oh, wow. Have you heard about this guy, Charles Dowding? You should look him up. Look him up on YouTube, dude. He's a good gardener, dude. Um, so that's my response. Google no dig. <laughs> Google no dig. <laughs> <laughs> no dig sounds funny. In America, we call it no till. I think no dig is a lot more like, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. I'm not really tilling in my garden. Well, I mean, exactly. Digging. Yeah, I mean, it's an in, uh, t I, I think of tilling as being an industrial process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. You're just digging your garden. Just digging in me garden. <laughs> he digs it, folks. <laughs> he digs it. Well, he doesn't. He, dig, he digs no dig. <laughs> um, oh. How's your how's your garden doing, Dan? Any updates? How's the spreadsheet going? I haven't consulted the spreadsheet. <laughs> it's been too long. I need to run back to my spreadsheet. I know. I have some data I need to input in my spreadsheet as well. Hmm. I'm running a little late. We have... Um, all of the vegetables that we planted in December that I thought were like might result in some kind of winter crop. Obviously, we planted uh, them very late. Planted things on the first of December and hoping that they might do something over winter is a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a stretch. Obviously, they did grow. They sort of like they all germinated for the most part sure. and grew. So we've gradually transplanted them all to our raised bed. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So now we have some lamb's lettuce and mm. some pak choy. Oh, cool. And we also moved some spring onions. I don't mm. know how the spring onions fared in being transplanted. I don't know whether mm. any of them fared well in being transplanted, particularly they were all quite small. Mm. Um, we had them in a bed outdoors, but under glass. Mm. And then we've since sown lots of new things in that bed. Oh. Hoping that that might function as our, <laughs> I don't know, place to germinate seeds. <laughs> I mean, it's not necessarily warm enough, but we don't have a greenhouse and we don't have a lot of window, window mm. space inside. So, mm. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, just, as I was telling you right before this, multi-sown leeks, which I'm excited to see how that goes. Uh -huh. So I put three seeds in each little kind of pod. Um, we'll see. Uh, Charles Dowding uh -huh. has assured me Who? that it's actually, yeah, Google him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it sure me that's the way to do it. Okay. So we'll see. I did that. Did some cabbage. Um, not multi sown And that's about that. My potatoes are still just kind of sitting there. Mm. Um, and yeah. I had um, steamed leeks. Ooh, steamed leeks. Recently. Interesting. Steamed leeks. And they get very gooey inside. It's almost like mashed potato. Is it good? <laughs> Delicious. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, a revelation. How'd you do it? Did you just like cut them in half and then like... I, um, they, we cut them down to like... Mm. Six inches in length, kind of thing, mm. and steamed mm. them as a steamed them as a Ooh. steamed leak tube. <laughs> Some sort of steamed leak, Sounds like a Simpsons joke. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, that's my recommendation: steam leaks, steamed leaks, folks, and uh, roasted cauliflower leaves. Ooh, leaves, mm. cauliflower leaves. Mm. A long time ago, mm. I believe you served me. I did. Leaves. I mean, I wasn't. I, it was. It was not my doing. <laughs> sure, sure. But I, I you were was, present. I was present. <laughs> yeah, I was present at the service. I was this. addicted to those. Those were so good. I was like, "What are these? These are leaves." <laughs> <laughs> they were so good. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Culinary. Um, culinary tips, folks. Mm. The podcast preferred uh, method of cooking leeks <laughs> steamed. <laughs> The podcast preferred method of metabolizing the bounties of nature? <laughs> Eating. Eating, yes, indeed. <laughs> Actually, if you steam your leaks long also... enough, you can inject them. But you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dried and crushed. <laughs> dried leeks. Very exciting. Um, garlic's in the ground. Onions are in the ground. Realize that I made my beds, my no-dig beds, Dan. I don't know if I'm telling you. I don't know if I've told you that I'm actually doing no-dig. Um, too small, too thin. So I've had to, like, like uh shore them up a bit and i just realized like why don't i make these so thin i should be... i think i was trying to save compost yeah, yeah, and like trying to make a little bit go a long way yeah. but um very exciting there's one garlic clove that i'm imagining it's a crow could be a magpie of some sort um i'm on team magpie though so i'm hoping it's a crow has just been taking it out this one clove and then not <laughs> eating it and just setting it by the hole and it's happened three times at my allotment and i'm like just, buy, just uh -huh. leave this clove be <laughs> You sure yeah. it's not like a, labor, a, a neighboring allotment home? <laughs> it could be. Yeah. So the guy who has it's, will be about no dig. Yeah, you're being um, 
It's a, pr- it's a prank. Oh dear. <laughs> That's what about no dick. <laughs> my enemy. My allotment enemy. No dick soil actually rejects. <laughs> yeah. It spits it out. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you idiot. Um, but yes, that's about that. Spring is on its way, and so I'm very excited to, uh, yeah, just get all of the spring vegetables in. Very exciting. Um, I realized that all of the strawberry plants that I thought were weeds that I pulled out, I thought some of them were going to survive. They did not, so I will have no strawberries. You I'm pulled not... them out thinking they were weeds, realized yeah. they were strawberry plants, planted them again. <laughs> well, I just left one. I didn't realize, but it, oh, I think I, I just ripped out the root or something like that. I don't know. Disaster. So no strawberries for me. Uh-huh. Um, I'm fine with that, though. Honestly, what are you going to do? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's my update for the week. Weather and allotment. Yeah. Um, all good, folks. It's been raining. It has been raining again. Mm. You're right. Yes. Mm. Mm. What did we say was our preferred form of precipitation? Snow? <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think yeah. not preferred was sleet. I think we covered that. Yeah, snow, rain, sleep. Snow, rain, sleep. Yeah. All right. I mean, sure. like, yeah. <laughs> Let's know. Bonus episodes. <laughs> we'll rank them. We'll rank them. Let's, let's fill us in on what options there are. <laughs> yeah. Where will hail land? <laughs> did I you re- about Did you hail. notice the other day it was like warm in the morning for like two hours and then it got really windy, then it got really cold and it hailed for 30 minutes and then it cleared up again. I was just like, what am I supposed oh, to do with this? I missed, I missed that. Yeah. It's no good. Yeah. Don't get it all, folks. Don't go outside. <laughs> um, well, Dan, uh, long-awaited uh, reading on metabolic rift. And by long-awaited, I mean we talked That's about right. it last episode. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are. We're back firmly in the um, bosom of uh, capital M Marxism. We enjoyed our foray into anarchism for last week. Mm-hmm. That was a blast. Mm-hmm. A little too much. A little too much. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh. A little too much. I had to run back to where it was safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if at least 50% of what we read isn't just block quotes of Marx, then, you know, no good. <laughs> um, but this week, Dan, we are reading a collection of essays. I don't really remember what they're called. I suppose I could look. But by John Bellamy Foster, among others. And friends. And friends. <laughs> um, all about... Metabolic Rift. Um, I suppose I should look up the longer one, what the actual name of that was. It was Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift. (laughs) Classical Foundations for Environmental Sociology by John Bellamy Foster. And it was in um, the American Journal of Sociology, I want to say, something like that. Uh, Just look it up. I don't know. We'll have it in the description. Um, But yeah. We've literally never done that. Oh, no, we put the name in. We put (laughs) the name in. We don't put a link. Okay. (laughs) I was like, have we not done that? We do put the names (laughs) It's true. It's true. Um, Yeah, Metabolic Rift. I don't think anybody's ever read those. Yeah, well, if they had, they'd be very offended. (laughs) Like, wow, these guys are a lot stupider than we thought. Um, Before we get into it, let's just say how funny it was. It is a trick. How funny it was. Uh, Today, Dan and I saw a comment on one of our videos. I believe it was the Ellen Meeks Wood Origin of Capitalism for someone who was saying, like, this will help me out a lot with my thesis. And I were both just like, oh, oh your <laughs> thesis, you might fail. But you didn't hear that from us if you're relying on us. Um, but thank uh, you. We, 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 we are very happy to be your <laughs> supplementary material. Your auxiliary material. Auxiliary <laughs> material, indeed. <laughs> but um, that yeah. person was consulting the primary sources. Absolutely. So, this is more of just like a, you know, ease into it kind of thing. Like yeah. a... Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. Um, lay of the land. Lay of the land. Get your bearings. Exactly. Indeed. So feel a bit more familiar and safe. If I see uh, auxiliary statements uh, cited, <laughs> pieces, <laughs> I might I might have to end it. I don't know. That would be too much. Uh-huh, uh-huh, That'd be classic, uh-huh. though. But yes, to you, yeah, good please luck. Please don't do that. Please don't do that, but good luck on mm-hmm. your thesis. Um, where were we? Metabolic Rift. Very exciting. So yeah, two essays. One of them was just in a... The other one was much shorter. It was just in a book believe called the Marx Handbook, which is just a collection of a lot of very short um, introductory essays by a bunch of different people on various topics. And this one was by Brett Clark, John Bellamy Foster, and Stefano Bilongo um, as an introduction to metabolic rifts and the ecological crisis. This paired very well, I would say, with uh, our anarchist reading with um, Murray Bookchin, because a lot of what he was talking about, about monoculture and about um, hierarchy and about how that uh, relates to our production. Um, 
this was a little bit more of like a, well, sociological, I will say, reading of the whole thing. And I found it very enlightening, I will yeah. say. Sociological, mm. historical. Historical. I mean, a important piece of the overlap is the way that Bellamy Foster presents um, Marx as being, uh, Marx and Engels, I suppose, mm. um, as being thinkers who uh, don't privilege like society over nature or nature over society, but mm. sort of attempting to gra- describe that sort of, the synthesis of the two. Yeah, were. and focusing on the relationship definitely between the two mm. as a way of not just focusing on one or the other, I found sure, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, in one, one of these essays that we read, um, Bellamy Foster's sort of setting out to sort of set the record straight on um, how sociology as a discipline reflects on um, the contribution of its sort of like founding or classical thinkers yeah, yeah, to yeah. the idea of uh, ecological social sociology, mm. particularly the idea that uh, Marx and Weber and Durkheim were all... <laughs> uh, reacting against a certain kind of like uh social darwinism and sort of so a sort of theory of uh human beings relationships to nature that was very sort of like biologically centered mm. um by sort of swinging in the opposite direction and really emphasizing like um society and i guess the power of um, human beings mm. to control nature mm. um and he's trying to rebut that by suggesting that in all of those thinkers, but obviously in this case, he's talking primarily about Marx. In all of those thinkers, there is um, a huge amount of like, well, varying degrees anyway, of a sort of ecological awareness. Nuance, that, one might nuance, say. Quite, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which has since been lost to um, sociology. Mm. Um, largely because sociology's in- interaction with um, ecological thinking was sort of driven by a very strong dichotomy between everything that came before it, which was seen as being very, um, what's the word, like human-centered. Mm. Um, anthropocentric. Anthropocentric <laughs> in its thinking. Um, and resu- resorting to the opposite variant of that very strongly, mm. which is like a very sort of ecologically-centered kind of like recenter yeah. ecology. Obviously, yeah. like, uh, that is not, as we're saying, that's not what Marx is trying to do. That's not what Bellamy Foster in the presenting Marx is trying to do. Mm. They're very much more in line with what Bookchin was trying to do, which was sort of yeah. like describe the sort of the, the relationship between the two. Um, mm. And obviously, Marx falls back on this piece of terminology, metabolism. Yeah, it was funny because he had the German word in there and I translated it and it translated as olfactory odor. And I was like, oh, I can't oh. be right. <laughs> I was like, oh, that must be something going wrong here. The one thing, I, so I thought it was so interesting in this, how um, Foster is like really trying to extrapolate a solid theory of ecology. And as you say, like social ecology from Marx and from a lot of these thinkers. But it's funny because like specifically with Marx, he has to extrapolate pretty much from like this one main topic that Marx talks about, which is soil fertility. Uh-huh. And I thought that was so interesting just how much he was able to like create an entire like what uh, school of thought around just Marx's more or less study on soil fertility. Because it seemed like when Marx would talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the tension between like um, town and country, city and country, whatever... And about how so much of, like, what is being created in the country is being siphoned off and is going directly to um, cities, because that makes sense. You know, if you produce food in the country, it needs to go to where a lot of people uh, live. That makes sense. Um, But it was interesting because that exact same line of thought, right, gets applied to soil fertility. Because it's like, it was such a great metaphor for, like, labor power, what labor creates, leaving the country by saying... No, the energy that is literally created through nature and through our harnessing of nature, through farming, uh, gets shipped away to be, like, consumed in cities or something like that, and then basically just, like, you know, squandered. It never basically returns to the earth. Um, I thought that was such an interesting, like... I mean, it started out as kind of a metaphor, but then it was like, oh, Foster's point is that this is the starting point for an entire ecological theory, like a social ecology. I thought that was so neat. It was like, oh, wow, that's, that's basically, like two of the exact same things, and it all just comes down to this theory of capitalism. That blew my mind. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's very much like the the social ecology of Bookchin, mm. uh, the not maintaining the, I suppose, what, I can't remember what phraseology he would have used, but like the systemic balance, I suppose, yeah, yeah, between yeah. nature and society. Mm. 
Um, and Marx, Marx um, builds upon his description of the division of labor to mm. sort of describe that um, tension between town and country. Basically, fewer and fewer people are actually working in the in agriculture, I suppose, in mm. the countryside. But due to sort of increases in agriculture productivity, fewer and fewer people working in agriculture can actually support really large populations in cities. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you're describing, like, um, so much of that process is the removal of um, nutrients or, mm. I mean, from one place and transporting it to another kind of thing. Yeah, either in the form of labor power or in the form of, as you say, like literal nutrients, like uh -huh. nitrogen, because that's not going back into the oh, soil. Oh, I see what you were saying about it being, uh, yeah, uniform, instead of like yeah. a... Like a a potential metaphor for a bigger picture. Kind yeah, of. exactly. But then instead of being a metaphor, it's like, oh, that's just his point. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. that's just his starting place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was it was also very funny. There's that section where the, he was going through um, Engels and Marx's letters where they were talking about how they were like, isn't it absurd that we have to ship in bat guano from like South America <laughs> when like Saxony just flushes all of its manure down the toilet <laughs> into the sea? I was like, yeah, there's oh, one yes. really funny quote when they're really sort of like <laughs> laying into London kind of thing. Yeah. Like, city of four and a half million people can't work out anything better to do with all of these sort of precious resources and to <laughs> pollute the Thames. Kind yeah, of thing. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the ways in which all of these different um, where, where you can extrapolate from the degradation of the soil, which is, I, I suppose, Marx's starting point when he when he's talking about human beings relationship to the environment mm. and how it extends into other areas and one of those areas like the pollution of the cities that results yeah. from yeah, all true. of these people yeah. living there without any like um yeah w without developing a sort of like all organic sort of synthetic way of mm. mediating these imbalances yeah, which I mean, like, the implication there kind of seemed to be, like, we should all just be, like, pooping on our fields, which, like, obviously that isn't it, but it's, like, we should all be, like, isn't realizing it? that, like, the nutrient cycle doesn't, mm -hmm. like, that's what this rift is. That's, like, what metabolic rift is, is that when you grow to apply it to monoculture again, as we did from last week, if you grow only corn all the time in one, like, 10 mile by 10 mile farm, right, and... Um, you basically take everything that the plant, uh, takes from the soil to produce like the corn and the food and everything else. Um, you don't let any of that return to the soil, either through rot or through, um, uh, compost or anything like that. Uh, and that just gets shipped somewhere else because no agriculture is really regionalized in the United States or anywhere like that out here anymore. Um, that just creates this rift where now you have to do something about the loss of nutrients in your soil, right? So the modern way of fig of kind of like, you know, figuring that out and getting around that is to just pump it full of nitrogen and pump it full of fertilizers. Yeah, yeah. And that like sounds good and it seems like it's okay, but then you're just removing the soil's uh, natural uh capabilities of re reproducing itself basically sure. yeah, right yeah, yeah. so then you're just creating like sand with nitrogen in it and it's going to get to a certain point where you just can't grow anything in it which is kind of where we're heading at the moment yeah 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 it makes me think of in Bookchin when he was talking about complex systems being resilient yeah and absolutely. simple ones being very prone to or very fragile and mm. prone to disruption kind of thing mm. and i wonder whether there is a synthesis there between that idea and what you were saying about like you reduced all the natural complexity of Absolutely. the soil and you're just trying to sort of pump it full of its mm. raw materials mm -hmm. kind of thing um and whether that leads to a much more fragile system yeah absolutely um, absolutely i mean yeah i mean i guess the other i, I guess we have to somehow reckon with like I guess the ultimate the ultimate solution is that well, not the ultimate solution necessarily, but like the the sort of deep green conclusion that one could take would be that everybody should live exactly where their food is produced. Oh, sure. They should eat all things that are locally produced and then put all the same minerals back into the ground that have come out of it, kind of thing. Yeah. The same plants that have grown there should rot in the same place. Um, mm. That would produce the most um, organic and natural environment for um, the production of. The sort of like the longevity of mm. uh, food. Production. Well, I am a primitivist after last and week, that, as yeah. I told you, so it sounds pretty good to me. Developing suspicious primitivist tendencies. <laughs> um, but even if that's not necessarily what we're saying, kind of thing, mm. like. Um, 
Yeah, maybe we should expand on that a bit because I mean, like, I think that does speak to like a complete necessity to re-regionalize agriculture. But yeah, it's like, yeah. well, what does that mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, Foster, at some point in one of these, gives the example of like um, less developed in sense of like a capitalist uh, way of thinking, you know, of like of a social mode i suppose a lot of these places would just like because everything was so regional it's like yeah you did just grow things around you know where you lived and you just ate that and blah 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 blah. you weren't like getting beef from argentina that was then packaged in china and then sent to you in new york to eat right sure. so i mean i guess like what would a sensible re-regionalizing of agriculture look like and i mean it certainly wouldn't just be like you only eat what's in your valley right that sure, only yeah, yeah. naturally grows there yeah. but it's like yeah, I suppose you would have to find, you know, not a middle ground, but like something where it makes sense. I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are there are there are um, absurdities that come from the capitalist mode of production. Mm. Ones as you describe, right? Mm. Like somehow it becomes more productive to <laughs> grow all this cattle in Argentina and ship it all around the world yeah. than it is to like um, have a cow regionally, have your own cow <laughs> kind of thing. Um, yeah, or just like you know, cows from like. Within a hundred miles or something like that, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, what? I guess what I'm saying is like those kind of efficiencies that are the efficiencies that are the 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 primary interest of capitalists because they're all all they're interested in doing is uh, mm. expanding their sort of production so that they can accumulate more value. Like, yeah, in a post capitalist and socialist world, like those imperatives would not exist. So um, there would be a sort of natural. Um, or at least like you you could intentionally then start to plan some kind of relationship between human beings and the, the way they produce food, which yeah. follows more of these principles kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was something that was touched on, right? Like very briefly, it was planning. Because sure, yeah, yeah. I think like Foster, you know, recognizes in Marx, where Marx, I mean, just comes out explicitly and says, yeah, if you're supposed to have free association of producers, like you would still need like, you know, smart agriculture production would require some kind of planning like it was interesting because at one point he did just say smart agricultural production sustainable agricultural production does not follow from uh the transition to socialism in any way yeah that would be like a whole not other thing but like it's not just going to happen mm -hmm. you know well one point in this he sort of lays out a whole series of criticisms that are leveled at marx um and i won't rattle them all off now but one mm -hmm. of them is as you say like as soon as you make this transition sort of like socialism will actually solve these problems or like yeah. environmental concerns will will by definition not be concerns for mm. socialist kind of thing yeah or um if you expand um productive capacity in the way that marx is usually attributed to have emphasized as being the the main way to socialism right like mm. you you accelerate uh capitalism sort of mm. bountiful degree of productivity um <laughs> and repurpose it kind of thing yeah um, then you can have huge abundance and you wouldn't even need to have these environmental concerns be considerations mm. um foster is obviously trying to rebut that criticism of marx mm. um as you say like mm. marx very explicitly suggests that ecological planning would be a facet of the planning that would be necessary to have mm. the as you say the the sort of socialist society that was uh, was premised and benefit based upon a free association of yeah. laborers kind of thing yeah it's interesting too and that kind of like gets into the next bit of like what was i didn't write it down was it like jevon's paradox jevon's paradox yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that yeah. where it was like the, i mean I, I suppose i should back up a little bit because foster says that technology as it relates to like production doesn't necessarily make like it makes raw material usage and, like, production more efficient, but it doesn't really, like, lower the demands that you uh, place on the environment or on, like, I forget exactly the phrase he used, like, the bio, like, mass or whatever that you're using or that you're drawing from, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the paradox was was basically just like, what was it? It was something along the lines of like, if you find an easier way to extract coal from the earth, you're actually going to wind up consuming more coal and burning more coal mm -hmm. just because now you have more coal and there's an easier way to do it, right? Or is I misunderstanding that? I th no, I think you're correct. Mm -hmm. There are portions of one of these essays where he talks about um, energy mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think the suggestion is that the modern capitalist mode of production is incredibly wasteful in its use of energy um, in terms of like agricultural production in rural settings, transporting all of those um, foodstuffs to cities mm. and then having to transport guano from Peru or whatever <laughs> so that you can put it back on the soil in as a, as a sort of natural fertilizer for yeah. the soil kind of thing. Um, as being incredibly like energy intensive. Mm. Um, so what you might imagine the solution to that being is that you use technological advance mm. to make your systems more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. But I think the crux of Jevons paradox is that um, under capitalism anyway, like the, the resulting efficiencies only lead to um, an effort to exploit even more kind of yeah. thing. There's greater exploitation of nature because mm that's the primary mechanism of capitalism kind of thing like yeah which like monoculture like that's that's kind of exactly what that is it's like you found a more efficient way to like use your fertilizers and to grow stuff but it's like in the long run it's like oh wow you're just uh uh really only being very short-sighted in terms of your uh profit maximization because in the long run ooh, i don't know about that when you give it all to your dumb fail son all of your <laughs> stuff i don't know he's probably gonna run your company into the ground because there's no more soil there's just sand um, yeah, I mean, I guess that talks a lot about, like, the technological determinism that you can find in a lot of, like, maybe more utopian ecology and, envi well, I, maybe I should say environmentalism. Um, just this idea that we've seen kind of pop up over and over again in d different readings about, like, well, technology will kind of, like, just say it'll sort itself out, you know what sure. I mean? Like, we just get better ways of producing things and a faster, more efficient plane to take my meat packaged in China packaged and grown in goddamn Argentina, you know, it's like that's not really like getting to the crux of the problem. Nothing against Argentina, I'm pretty sure we have some Argentinian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. More so goddamn uh, Argentinian uh, cattle industry, maybe I should say. <laughs> um, I see. But yeah, I don't know. Again, it just speaks against like technological determinism. Right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the, I don't, yeah. I mean, it, it certainly speaks against any suggestion that, um, well, I guess there's a reading of this Jevons paradox, which mm. you could apply to the idea that capitalist technology could fix uh, capitalism's ecological crisis. Sure. Like if, if the ecological crisis we're suffering and the environmental crises we're suffering are all the result of um, the exploitative nature of the capitalist mode of production, not only to exploit workers, but to exploit the environment as well. Yeah. Um, Jevons paradox ought to imply that there is no capitalist technological solution to said ecological crises. Mm. Um, and the only solution is a radical transformation of the mode of production. Exactly. Um, yeah. Now, that might not be the only way to read Jevons paradox. That might mm. not even be the reading that Bellamy Foster is suggesting. But Let's read it like that. Let's read it as such because... Uh, <laughs> Um, why yeah. not uh, yeah well i'm not going to come up with a new more nuanced <laughs> one what nuance on this podcast <laughs> nuance get out of here no way <laughs> no, no i can't even spell way. it <laughs> um who was it at the end was it he was talking about oh i always get these two confused for some reason it was either bukharin or kautsky um bukowski as bukowski. some have called them he was he was talking about bukharin at length i think yes. yeah where um, this just, again, made me, because of my VSM brain, think about um, the viable systems model. Because at one point, I believe, did you say it was Bukhari? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think Kapsky is reference. Basically, yeah. what he's saying is that like the way that the Soviet Union ravaged its natural mm. environment mm. <laughs> uh, and paid absolutely no heed and <laughs> in some cases seemingly just actively tried to just destroy and... <laughs> Uh, desecrate everything he gave a little well, bit of like it was, clout to lenin Maybe yeah yeah word, yeah i mean it's like... it, 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 basically he's saying that that's mostly um a result of the sort of stalinist transformation mm. of the soviet union sure. and these early early both social democratic and bolshevik thinkers katsky lenin and bakarin mm. all like mm. took very seriously the idea of yeah ecological crisis um I mean, he's suggesting that there is a there is a straight through basic run from Marx onwards. Like sure. Marx did seed into the workers' movement a concern for the environment, which mm. um, was only destroyed later yeah. um, in the Soviet Union and to some extent in post Second World War. Yeah, West absolutely. As well, he, yeah, he threw a little shade at the uh, Frankfurt School, kind uh -huh. of for he was like, well, they developed a bit of an ecology, but 
everything was framed by them basically uh, but what yeah you say about the current yeah no i was just gonna say that that frames it well because he i just thought that it was interesting how he basically just said what marx was saying in a different way as saying that none of our advances in terms of technology none of our production none of any of that none of anything that we do uh occurs outside of an environment right and he doesn't mean like environment like whoa dude like the environment bro like he's talking about just very literally like you know we produce things and it's again it's like going back to uh that gendered quote that marx had that we talked about last week about um uh labor being the father and nature being the mother it was more about just putting both of those things on equal footing because it's like yes labor is the uh way in which we kind of like harness nature to create more use values blah 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 blah, and more value um but you do need to take heed of like <laughs> nature and the environment with which you're doing that because it, it doesn't even make sense in a capitalist way of thinking about things to treat nature the way that we're treating right now because like if you actually wanted to maximize your profit for a really long time you'd be thinking about what you're putting in the soil but you know again that's the short-sightedness of the market cycle and tying like soil health to the market which is like a dog could tell you <laughs> that's the stupidest thing on the planet um but yeah anyway that just reminded me of a viable systems model because mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh you know operations meta system environment mm. everything reminds me of that and i see it i see it like in, in sand I'm like the viable systems model there it is <laughs> If you haven't already, go check out our go check out our video. On YouTube. <laughs> good plug, good plug. Our uh, Bible Systems Model Explainer. I think it went over 100 views today. It did. Which, really? Like, cool. I'm stoked about it. That's awesome. Yeah, we got a professor to narrate it, which is really cool. I um, don't know who that guy was. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's, it's good that you bring up labor, I think, because it's mm. quite an important part of this in, in multiple respects. Marx describes labor as the sort of like how human beings mediate the process by which they sort of like metabolize mm. Mm. nature i suppose mm. and energy and in a very like literal yeah, sense yeah, yeah. um how they uh, the, the relationship between society and nature is mediated by human labor mm. um i guess i mean we haven't really talked about metabolism very much or <laughs> or, <laughs> or metabolic <rift. laughs> what the hell is metabolic rift? can i just say before we get into that that there was a line that was something like um blah, 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 the original sources of wealth, the worker, and the soil. And I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, hell yeah. That was so cool. Anyway, what is metabolic crypt? I, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> I guess I, like Marx is borrowing metabolism. There's a suggestion in this that, well, it's, it's said in this that Marx and Engels are the first people to apply the idea of metabolism to society and to say mm. that like there is a societal process by which society metabolizes the f fruits of nature, I mm, suppose. Sure. Um, and the vegetables of nature. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to create, I will say just really quickly, like to create not just like food, but to create like chairs and buildings and anything else that we create, really. Because yeah, that's yeah, yeah, all yeah. obviously where yeah, it comes yeah, yeah. from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've come across this in capitalism, in mm. capitalism, in in in, in our, our brief foray into capitalism. No, in our, <laughs> our brief foray into capital. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it again, and I was like, "Damn." <laughs> um, yeah, we've come across this idea in our brief mm. foray into capitalism. <laughs> yeah, we have brief, very brief. Um, that uh, well, I wrote I, I wrote down something about like uh nature equaling use values kind of thing mm. or mm. use values being um something which stem from nature kind of thing sure. like the material use, the you you the usefulness of certain materials and certain objects have their basis in the um material qualities mm. of uh the, um, the inputs yeah yeah <laughs> which absolutely. which uh, and as you say they come from nature mm. um i mean one of the one has said other criticisms of marx which uh, Bellamy Foster attempts to um, rebut mm. um, is this idea that because Marx was so fixated on labor, mm. he entirely ignored the portion of the the value of things which comes from nature. Sure. Um, which to some extent leads to um, the potential, I suppose, of an idea in which like nature is just there to be the raw inputs for mm um for labor mm. and that sort of like very crude um idea which like 
Marx and Engels in several places in this are quoted as like <laughs> severely criticizing the idea that nature is simply there yeah. to be exploited by human beings kind of mm. thing. But still that's a sort of idea that's sometimes associated to Marx. Mm. Um and I guess some of the crux of that is the is is made reference to in the fact that Marx holds to the labor theory of value and suggests yeah. that all labor all value comes from a misunderstanding would be to say that yeah. value comes from labor. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, what we know is that like what Marx is describing in capital is the inner workings of capitalism mm. value and the types of labor, which produce it, the abstract labor that produces value in a Marxist sense, mm. um, have basically nothing to do with the useful qualities of either the, the products that are created or Hence, I also the useful qualities of sure. um, nature, kind of thing. Mm. It's it's capitalism in its very workings, which privileges a certain type of labor and ignores and minimizes the inputs of nature, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, it's only with a properly Marxist understanding that you can understand the sort of like the relationship between social production for big V value, which is the basis of capitalism, mm. and that capitalist society's relationship to the natural mm. world. Mm -hmm. um, Marx very implicitly says that mm. um, nature, nature is an equal contributor to the value of things. Yeah, absolutely. In a sense of use value, in a yeah. sense of human usefulness. Yeah. I just feel like I need to like, <laughs> let's be very clear. Let's try not to say <laughs> anything too wrong about Marx's <laughs> labor theory. <laughs> what Marx was saying <laughs> was... <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, at, at a certain point, that's just really simple because it's like you wouldn't have things if you didn't have a pool of raw resources from which to draw to make mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I suppose that's just one more important. I mean, so I mean, so now we're in a position to explain methodology <laughs> rift if we haven't already. You know done. what, Dan? We, Go <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is basically it's quite a simple idea, really. Like, um, and it, in some ways, I feel like it just builds off the use value exchange value distinction. Mm. Um, Basically, all, the, all that's implied by metabolic rift is there is this gap between what's being taken from nature and what's being put back in. Exactly. Um, and we're overextending or exploiting nature, or at least capitalism exploits nature in mm. ways which it can't possibly renew. Mm. Um, and uh, Marx was building this theory based, as you say, around the crises in, in agriculture that happened in the, mm. um, in the 19th century, which was like... A legitimate crisis and mm. caused like severe worry for capitalists and capitalism kind of thing mm. um i mean there was an interesting aside in this we could bring it might be worth mentioning where um bellamy foster draws this distinction between marx and um two other Ooh. theorists of political economy B B David bukowski Ricardo <laughs> <laughs> and um Thomas Malthus. Yeah. Um, Mal Malthus. I, ju I love it. I, <laughs> I just love it. Um, yeah, everybody's favorite villain. Yeah. I mean, almost like if I was writing back when he was writing, I'd probably be like, guys, don't too many people in the city. It's all we're all going to die. No, not enough <laughs> land. <laughs> I mean, it probably made sense back uh -huh, then. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But like... Um, uh, one of Marx's criticisms of those two thinkers is that those two thinkers both thought that the um, the value of land, which was represented by the rent that mm. was paid to the landlords, came from the uh, natural fertility of that soil kind of thing. Mm. And it, it was for Marx to come along and say, no, um, human action can improve the fertility sure. of soil kind of thing. Mm. I mean, we we I mean, we saw this. This was the basic nature of the the agriculture. The, but what's described in this is the first agricultural revolution. Yeah, is that, is that my phrase. Agricultural. Yeah, agricultural well, revolution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which which is the subject matter of our reading of Ellen Meeks's wood and the transition to capitalism. Indeed. Um, enclosures, crop right, rotation, enclosure, crop rotation, manure, the soil. <laughs> don't Dan, don't say those words. No, God damn it. Um, and. And the idea of improvement. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it took Marx to say no, no, mm. land doesn't have like a natural uh, ability to give. It doesn't have a natural uh, fertility. It can be improved, but at the same mm. time, 
the mechanisms of capitalism can lead to greater and greater exploitation of mm. um, of the land. So yeah, as we, as we've already said, like as the populations of the cities grew, there was more and more, and as the desire for um, tenant farmers and their uh, landlord overlords <laughs> to um, extract more and more from the land mm. led to this massive deficiency in in uh, uh, the fertility of the soil and this threat mm. of uh, reducing yields. And you, I mean, we've already me- referenced some of the ways in which they attempted to uh, find new fertilizers to put into the soil. You, you may, we, well, I mean, we've mentioned guano from Peru or somewhere, wherever it was. That right. Some, some, some more, um, more oh. macabre, macabre. Yeah. Oh my sources. God. There's like one bit in both of these. The bones. Sort of like he brings up the bones from the battlefields of the from, Napoleonic Wars. Literally from like Austerlitz and Waterloo. It's like, is that what battlefields were like? It's like you, you could just go and still find bones. I guess. And yeah. just grinding up the bones for fertilizer. I read that. I had to put it down. I was like, whoa. It's even, a metaphor for something. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, there's even some reference in one of these to. Um, Using ancient <laughs> Egyptian mummified cats. I'm all for that, yeah. honestly. Don't desecrate the dead, but cat, de- 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 Egyptian cats, go for it. Oh, okay. You just have to be wary of the spell that's going to be put upon you for Ooh. disrupting that cat's life, <laughs> afterlife. I don't know. I feel like I'm more attached to the cats. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, I mean, really, the obvious solution is to just ship, so all, the, ship all the shit of the cities back to the, the countryside. But, exactly. Well, and also, I believe, I believe it did happen at certain points in history, but um, yeah, was never a capitalist. Solution. Well, I mean, and also, if you don't want to ship human poop, I mean, the yeah. way that they talk about like capitalists trying to completely control the life cycle of, say, a cow or a chicken by just like, you know, keeping it in a box and then like cleaning up its poop and either throwing it out or giving it to some factory that's going to make manure and ship it off somewhere else. That's completely just doing the exact same thing. That's metabolic rift because it's just the energy that's there is being shipped somewhere else or just binned, just completely destroyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be human poop, guys. It can just be cow poop. Yeah, any poop. Any, any poop, poop will do. Horse, horse poop. Horse poop would be fantastic. Okay. I could actually use a bit more horse poop. I mean, there frankly. was that impending threat at the beginning of the, the, the 20th century that like... <laughs> The, the streets of major metropolis, mm. metropolises, metropolises mm. New York and London. Yeah, like the Brooklyn. streets are just going to become full of the organic horse city. <laughs> Walt Whitman wrote a poem, I think, called "The Organic City," or he wrote something about it, and he was trying to make this like Brooklyn is the perfect city because, like, the ri- <laughs> this is so vile. He's like the rich, like throw their scraps into the streets and the wandering feral pigs eat the scraps and then the poor people eat the pigs. So it's all one happy cycle. And it's like, you psychopath? How's that a good cycle? It's the perfect social metabolism. I, yeah, it's like just the the poor will just eat the feral pigs that survive on the scraps of the rich. Literally, the poor people aren't even surviving on the They're scraps of the rich. It's yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> Brooklyn still hasn't changed. So <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, there's another bit of the metabolic rift uh, idea, too, that I think needs mentioning, and that it's not just this idea of shipping energy somewhere else. It's that the our ecosystem's natural ability to do away with harmful um, things, think carbon, think, um, just think carbon for now, mm-hmm. um, is being done away with because, you know, carbon sinks like uh, uh, the Amazon rainforest or just any forest, really, that's being leveled for uh, profit maximization re- reasons, whether that's for firewood or whether that's just for farming land or for, you know, grazing land or something like that. That just completely does away with um, the planet's ability to get rid of all of this carbon, which we're producing, obviously, at an exponentially higher rate than we've ever done. Uh, and when I say we, I just basically mean, like, everything alive on the planet. But it's our fault, obviously. But, like, Not only is there a rift in that we're creating an excess on one end of carbon, but there's also um, the like negative is being taken away too because the planet's ability to uh, deal with that carbon is being destroyed, and that's that's another version of metabolic rift. Sure, yeah. There's there's one point where he talks about carbon rift, isn't there? Yeah, which is basically the same thing. Mm. I mean, yeah, that's the 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 basis of the crisis that we face now is one around feedback loops mm. like i mean to some extent this is a disruption of uh like forests that would be natural carbon sinks kind of thing sure. but also like um and also like the the melting of the ice scraps is mm. reducing the earth's albedo so that we're reflecting mm. less out light into space kind of thing but also like melting permafrost and mm. 
I don't know, all sorts of other places where like once a temperature once a temperature tipping point is reached, it's going to result in this even greater mm. release of carbon from these natural carbon sinks in the world kind of thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, there is this rift opening up between how much carbon we're taking and pumping out mm. um, than compared to how much the sort of natural environment is able to tolerate yeah. and compensate for. Um, yeah. So yeah, like the the I, 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 the implication of that, I suppose, is that um, although Mar all of Marx's writing was around the, met the the metabolic rift, which is evident in 18th century agriculture, like there are other applications for mm. this idea. I mean, it's a quite simple one, really, isn't it? it we're is, just yeah. like <laughs> we're, we're we're disrupting the organic balance of our <laughs> ecosystem. Well, yeah. Apologies. Oops. Capitalism is disrupting the organic balance of our ecosystems. Um, in such a way that it just doesn't have the capacity to repair. Yeah, exactly. And that's one thing that frustrated me. I mean, I guess the longer I say that we read Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift, Classical Foundations for Environmental Sociology, wasn't just an attempt to explain metabolic rift. It did that. But I think that the point of the essay was more like uh, it was being written for a sociological journal. It was supposed to be about sociology and rebutting this like feud that quite frankly I, I wanted nothing to do with about like between like modern sociologists Neither and classical sociologists. sociologists. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Again, this is like a lot of what I have problems with whenever we kind of like read something that's very academic because it's like, okay, it's one thing to write something in a complicated way about something simple. It's another thing entirely when those ideas are like a necessity to be translated to a popular audience if we're supposed to have oh, any kind of like future. Yeah. And I mean, like, I get that, you know, uh, where Marxism is still alive, we're still kind of like on university campuses. And so maybe it's just that like we're looking in the wrong places, but it's like, I don't know, I get very frustrated with like, just come out and say that it's like, you know, a simple way of defining metabolic rift, which is, I guess, what the second essay was. I mean, that one, which was in the Marx handbook, was like five pages or something like that. It was just a very like, uh, here's what it is. It's bad. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just because like Marxism is supposed to be like easily understandable or maybe not easily understandable, but easily translated if we're supposed to be getting these ideas to any kind of popular audience, you know. I don't know. Academics, what are you going to do? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Folks. Yeah. I mean, I worry that we're engaged in quite an academic exercise. <laughs> Maybe oh. we ought to just try and read less academic yeah. things. Or, um, <laughs> yeah, what's the use of this idea other than sort of like... Yeah. I mean, it gives you some other meat to chew on kind of thing. Sure. Or like, um, it's, an, it's, a nice way to it's a nice way to frame the problem and also it, um, it introduces us to some, some of the problems in the ecosystem that mm. will need to be resolved kind mm. of thing. Well, I think in terms of like, you know, if you want to explain the problems of capitalism to someone who isn't like, has any kind of background in Marxism or anything like that, I think this would be a pretty good place to start because not only does it get rid of the like, all environmentalists are just dumb hippies, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, it gets rid of, it's like just an easy way of being like, here's the issue in the way that we've produced things. There are other ways to produce the things that we need to survive. And this is a very simple way to see why where that goes wrong and how it could potentially be apocalyptic listen to me i'm not crazy <laughs> <laughs> it's the apocalypse folks it might already be too late <laughs> it could be yeah I mean, it could be it could very easily be um po I, it, has there ever been any writing about a post-apocalyptic uh rebirth from the ashes phoenix like rise of socialism oh, <laughs> i don't know i don't know i don't think i'd want to read that no. that sounds too sad it's funny because, like, in this, I do like it whenever uh, a Marxist is like, here's what you thought Marx said, you idiot. Here's what he actually said. There's a lot of that in this. And I did like the kind of one that was, like, just the general idea of, like, uh, whenever they say you thought Marx was a technological determinist or you thought Marx was, like, an ecological, or not ecological, an uh, economic determinist, anything like that. Um, I like it when we come across something like this that's like, no, actually, you can extrapolate like an extremely well thought out, like materialist conception of ecology from like what Mark yeah. said. It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, it does seem like there are infinitely many like varied exegetical mm. readings you can have of Marx. Exactly. Yeah. It's like he was just things. talking about soil. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Foster's, yeah exactly. But for, it's yeah, a method. From, from, from such a like um, uh, 
a, a polymath that Marx was kind of thing. Yeah. Like, the things that he would try and lend his hand to or try and understand kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. When they talk about their, their excitement about all... I mean, like, I think Marx was friends with this guy who's meant to be the Leap? founder of Soil Science. Leap? Like Leap, Leapig or Leap yeah. something? Just as von Liebig, who yeah. also seems to have been quite a sort of social... Mm. Uh, who was minded towards socialism as well. Yeah. Um, and was sort of, like, discovered quite a lot about... Mm. Um, or founded the nascent science of soil agriculture kind of thing. Mm. Um, and Marx seems to have corresponded with him and been quite friendly with him. And that seems to have been yeah. the basis of so much of their understanding kind of thing. Didn't he reference um, him in an, a letter to Engels and he was like, my friend, Lipe, I was yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> and there was one point in this where, I don't know, was, it, was he corresponding with... Um, Darwin or somebody. I think maybe he was friends with the person Darwin. who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he, I think they may have corresponded. I forget the guy. I'm sorry, like. Um, <laughs> there was a guy. The immortal slight. The other guy that came up with evolution and never gets remembered. Um, Darwin. No. <laughs> no, there was another guy. Yeah. Oh, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. The Beagle. Mark seems. Mark may well have um, corresponded with a turtle at some point. I <laughs> Um, I, yeah, what was it that we read recently? Was it Bookchin where he said the two greatest um, materialists ever, Darwin and Marx? <coughs> that might have been something else. I don't know. But when I, I was doing some, that statement. I was huh, endorse it. Mm -hmm. Oh god, mm -hmm. I was. I think I was doing a deep dive before we read our Bookchin, trying to figure out something to read. And um, I yeah, I think I came across something. It might have been him where he said that, and I was like, yeah, right on. It is. I love god, the bit in this when he was talking about Marx and Engels talking about Darwin. That was cool. Mm -hmm. That was just real. How they were like, this makes total sense. Mm -hmm. The applications of this towards like sociology, perhaps not so much, but this is awesome. It was really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one point I was just going to highlight because it, it marries up with something that we suggested this last week, mm. whereby a certain type of materialism could be well married with this idea that there is a feed, there is a feedback and influence from the environment onto mm. human beings. Kind oh, of sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a point in this where John Bellamy Foster basically just says that Marx basically proposes or founds a form of historical environmental materialism. Mm. And he implies that basically what this allows us to do is to account for the co-evolution of nature and society together, which again, sort of bringing us back to both Bookchin and also where we started kind of thing. Like it's not just about like a one way direction between. Exactly. Yeah, um, absolutely. Human beings exploiting the environment mm. kind of thing or, mm. or privileging a natural environment over human beings. But mm. Um, I mean, as we've talked about already, like, and uh, as Bookchin talks about, and as in this is talked to talked about in terms of Marx's ideas about uh, what a future social society and how it will be organised around um, consensual democratic planning, mm. like you have to work out how to marry the the desires, but also the long term longevity, longevity of uh, the human species mm. to the requirements of nature, kind of thing, and you can't mm. sideline one. For the interests of the other absolutely absolutely yeah 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 it yeah it makes you kind of th again think differently about that the nature mother um labor father quote because it sure. is like yeah i mean you get what he was saying there but it's also like you know they are kind of like not one in the same obviously but like the relationship between them is kind of what needs to be focused on as opposed to both of them yeah individually. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah i mean maybe that's just like a crudely patriarchal <laughs> yeah metaphor oh, but not one which is meant to imply like a dominance a, a dominance mm. of <coughs> the masculine over the feminine but more certainly like, implies a passivity, more like yeah. a perhaps yeah i suppose mm. so yeah yeah yeah. Mm. it's true it's true isn't it yeah um, but i was well, i was gonna say maybe maybe more what it implies is kind of like a two uh related roles that oh are sure sort of meant to be different but complementary i mean obviously i don't want to endorse that <laughs> yeah no i think um, i think but... you're right because i think that what it wasn't original it was originally marx didn't say it was william sure, petty yeah, yeah, yeah. and so i think that when marx adapted it that is what he was trying to get across sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely um one yeah i kind of want to go back really quickly if we can to the agricultural revolutions bit sure. because i had a thought on that um so just really quickly for the royal listener um was it foster identifies the these three agricultural revolutions, right? Or I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's like uh, an accepted, accepted sort yeah, of sure. like schema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so uh, he comes across like three different revolutions in agricultural production. The first, as Dan, you were saying earlier, enclosures and mainly market relations as implied with or as correlated with um, agricultural production and that kind of like, you know, various technological improvements. Um, and then in the 1800s, 
the soil chemistry and improvements in fertilizer, like what you were saying. And then the third agricultural revolution was in the 20th century with more mechanized farming and things like that. Um, introduction of feedlots, genetic engineering with food. I wonder if we should include what I was thinking. Just my only thought on that was I wonder if we should include refrigeration in that because that's not, that's more of like a technological advance not made just for um, agriculture production, obviously, but I think that that is one that has had a huge impact on the Yeah, I mean, it, does, it, it, it implies it, but it also relates back to this idea that you, you can use greater energy inputs yeah. to develop yeah. a potentially even more irrational distribution of goods yeah. kind of thing. Like it yeah. just allows you to transport things over even more absurd distances because it's, in terms of like market efficiencies, it's the one that allows you to mm. produce for the lowest, yeah, for the highest gain at the lowest cost. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at what environmental cost, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. In, um, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, another part of that is like, as you say, the feedlots, but also like factory farming would be an mm. important part of that. And that oh, absolutely. We, yeah. we know what kind of metabolic rifts we're opening, mm. both in terms of antibiotic resistance, but sure. also like the the possibility of new novel virus transmission from animals uh, to human beings i forgot about no. virus <laughs> forgot about that i was just thinking about the apocalypse that would come via soil, soil. degradation <laughs> the soil apocalypse the soil apocalypse <laughs> um yeah i mean it's good i think as like a final thought for me a, it's good to have a phrase the phrase metabolic rift it's good to have a way to encapsulate all of these different energy losses in capitalism mm. and it's good to just have a way of pointing to something whether it's destruction of carbon sinks whether it's soil degradation whatever and just going metabolic rift that's what that is um and so yeah i think that's kind of like what i took away from this mm -hmm. as being the uh good thing that's my conclusion metabolic rift good phrase and it rolls off the tongue as well and you yeah. sound kind of smart when you say it Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before I knew what it was, when you kept rattling off, I was like, "What? Yeah. I really hey, oh, all right, four eyes. Work. <laughs> okay. <wear> glasses." <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose a closing thought for me. There was, there was, there was one point where um, Bellamy Foster, I suppose, speaking through Marx, um, uh, likened metabolic rift to um, human beings' estrangement from nature, mm. which I uh, mm. thought was mm. quite nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Become less strange with nature. Yeah. Be more strange with nature. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'm becoming a hippie, remember? So <laughs> yeah, that's I, true. I, I don't know. I don't know. I start, How much incense have you burned recently? I've been with my trees. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. I'm fine with that. Um, and sort of inspecting bark and just <laughs> having quiet moments. <laughs> Uh, you doing all right, buddy? <laughs> That's you talking to the tree. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. But I'm also asking you. <laughs> Talk to me as if you were talking to a tree. <laughs> I would love to live in a part of the world where you can just punch a faucet into a tree. Is this how it works? <laughs> and get syrup? Get Is that how it works? I don't know. I've been led to believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere along the line, we're going to have to work out how to tap trees for syrup. <laughs> Or the useful things. Can you just do that to any tree, but then you just get sap? And if you can, I mean, I suppose only certain trees produce that, yeah. certain useful saps, yeah. quantities of saps. Is it pine that produces a lot of sap? Yeah, I, I want to say yes. We'll have to ask someone. Ask the tree. Yeah. <laughs> you got a pine tree? Go ask your tree. <laughs> I mean, yeah. If you ask it, have you got nice sap? You'd be like, <laughs> no, mate. Jog yeah, on. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, buddy. I don't know about that. Here's another question for you: What is sap? What does sap do? I don't know. I mean, is it... I know in photosynthesis, one side of the equation has sugar. <laughs> I think. It's a, my ninth grade <laughs> biology says that it creates some sort of glucose, yeah, sucrose, food, something it, I mean, like that. It must be part of the transportation yeah. of nutrients. Yeah. Either water up or soil, up, soil down. Water or up, like soil sugar, down. sugar down. Or I don't know. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I have to read something about trees. We should read something specifically just about trees. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. Um, I'm Favorite down. tree? I'm down. I'm down. Podcast preferred tree? Mmm. I was saying to you recently that my favorite noise is wind going through pine trees, so I might have to say pine. Sure. Yeah, Pines yeah, are yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only recently becoming acquainted with varieties of trees, I suppose. Okay. Um, now I'm a little I'm, bit more suspicious I'm, of the word I'm acquainted <laughs> in that sentence. I'm partial to a you. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Cool, gnarly looking trees grow yeah, all over the place. Sure. Really weird looking berries. Mm. Have some kind of like symbiotic relationship with some kind of fungus, which is cool. 
Sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got stuff going on. They live quite a long time as well. Yew nice. Trees. And my mum grew up in a house where that took the name that took its name from a yew tree. So was it the yew house? Yeah, yew tree farm. Oh, house. cool. Yew like, tree farmhouse. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were some yew trees in the garden. I like this idea in England of naming houses. I think that's cool. Yeah. It'd be very weird if you did it like in California and yeah, you yeah, named yeah, a house. Yeah. The other thing that I come across, <laughs> like that I sort of glean from my, from what I've seen of American pop culture, is <laughs> like houses seem to be numbered up into the like thousands. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> whereas, yeah, I mean, at least in the town that we live, like mm. a, a, a road changes its name at like every roundabout or every intersection yeah. or every junction. Every so like, it's like slight bend. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, okay, we're suddenly on a new yeah. road again, kind of thing. You guys, I don't know, must have run out of numbers for yeah, your road. Indeed, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how it is in New York, but like in parts of LA, the like street numbers get up into the triple digits, and it's just like, <laughs> right, ran out of names, I suppose. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. I'm honestly, I'm more of a fan of that than naming it after like some person. Okay. Like, obviously, there are good people in uh, history of Los Angeles that have had streets named after them, and that's cool. Uh -huh. But like, do we need to name things after people? Come on, they're dead. Like, I get it. But the ideas, that's what I'm saying. The ideas, man. <laughs> Justice Drive. <laughs> Met Metabolic Rift Street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go around changing the street signs <laughs> around where I live. And just... We should do that. Yeah. We should go and rename all the streets <laughs> after concepts. That's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, have you noticed that there's... I meant, I've been meaning to ask you about this for like a year. Nearby us, there's like a sticker next to an Extinction Rebellion sticker, which makes me think that this means something, but there's just a large bumper sticker that says eating animals and it's on a stop sign or something yeah. like that. What is that? I don't... It's meant to read stop eating animals. Oh, okay. I didn't notice that I got ripped off. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like eating animals. It's like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Phrasing yeah. it like that yeah, makes... It's, ugh. it's been there a long time. Mm, eating long animals. Time. There's, there's many like graffiti stickers as you used to. Mm. We should get mm. some podcast stickers printed. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little red, the red square. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's back... what we do. <laughs> yes. Just... Stick them on lampposts. <laughs> yeah. Our community service when we get caught, we'll just be like, get rid of all these damn stickers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back in the day, uh, can you do this out here? You can get um, in America from the post office, you can just get like 100 free stickers, blank stickers from the post office. Sent to you for, for free. For writing on your envelopes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're huge. I don't believe and so. So no. people just like do little designs on them and stick them up everywhere. Um, so I always thought that was cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. I like that. Mm. We could just buy some stickers. Could just buy some stickers. Doodle on them. Doodle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, any good Star Trek? I watched a couple uh, Deep Space Nine recently because I'm like, I haven't seen all that. I need to watch it. Nice. It's Which good. ones did you watch? Um, just from the first season, because I keep forgetting where I stopped. So I just go back and just start again. Uh -huh. And I watched one where it was like really early on. It was like, um, <sighs> but you're, but you were around. And I'll yeah. be honest, not, the, not I'm at not, least I'm this half of the podcast. <laughs> Me neither. No, I've no, the and they're supposed to be like the cool revolutionary, like aliens. And it's just like, guys, no, come no, on. No, no, no. Here's what I think. <laughs> Cardassians, Klingons, Romulans. Our natural allies. That's just a fact of life. Oh, I see. They should in, all be in, allies. In universe allies. In okay. universe allies. They should be. Ferengi, uh, Bajorans, Betazoids, and the Federation. They're natural allies. Uh -huh. Actually, maybe Ferengi can kind of be in the middle. Sure. They're cool. Sure, but sure, like, sure. two guesses which side I'm picking. It's the Klingon <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How does the Federation keep winning all these wars against the Klingons? That's a I good understand. point. Well, I guess now, yeah, well, now and not now, but like, I guess they are allies. I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. I'll tell you, I'll tell you my meta theory about Deep Space Nine after this, because I don't think, All right. I don't think we've talked about it. All right. I was just going to say, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this. Mm -hmm. If you were to close your eyes and just hear these people talk, close my eyes. would you be able to tell the difference between a Cardassian, a Klingon, and a Romulan? Because I think that they're so closely, like, they sh that they should, they're natural allies. That's all I'm saying. And I Cardassians see. are the coolest. Then Klingons, then Romulans. Sorry. Actually, maybe Romulans second. They're all cool. Cardassians are dressed the coolest. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Would I be able to tell the difference? Um, I'm going to say yes. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a lot of like teeth prosthetics in the Klingons. You can probably That's hear that. That's true. Um, and like the, the 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 Romulans are like reverse Vulcans, right? So yeah, you can yeah. probably you can probably hear that. Mm. And um, n- n- none of them are as like smarmy as the Cardassians. True. Cardassians are very smarm. smarmy. Yeah. I think yeah, that I kind of yeah. got respect for that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Cardassians are smarmy. The Romulans are sinister, mm. and the Klingons are just like warriors. I'm redoing my redoing my uh, my order. Tailist. Klingons are the coolest. Okay, <laughs> they're the coolest. Klingons after coolest. Frankie. Sure. Yeah, I'm still not. I'm still not work this one out. <laughs> the ultimate species. Mm. Mm-hmm. My theory about Deep Space Nine is it's like an ultimate. I mean, it's probably somebody. I mean, it's not a unique <laughs> idea. I'm sure. Um, is it's basically premised on. A sort of Fukuyamaist end of history. Hmm, expand so on that. I think that, like, obviously the 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 Cardassians with their sort of like ludicrous show trial justice system uh. are meant to be like some kind of permanent Soviet Union at the height of the the, the purges right. kind of thing. Yeah. And I think the I think the Cardass I think the Bajorans are meant to be like a a post Soviet state that's just sort of like sure. gain its independence. Yeah. Um, Allowing it sort of culture and religion to be re-inherited, mm. and um, like Chechnya, and and and, like and, and uh, through the uh, spoilers through the course <laughs> of like um, the seven series of Deep Space Nine, and by the end, like it kind of feels like everybody's kind of settled on the same sort of like political and economic mm. system. Mm. Like mm. the the Klingons go for. Well, I mean, that this process of like taming the Klingons has gone on through all of the series, and I mean it's fine. <laughs> Um, and the, but the same is like they they seem to be sort of like becoming more and more uh, adopting more and more traits from the Federation, and I think the same like by winning the war against the the Cardassians, Card, the, sort of like political dissidents in Cardassia, mm. sort of like form a democratic government kind of thing. Anyway, mm. yeah, I think it's all, Interesting. I think it's all I think it's all very end of history informed. Mm. But there you go. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's why I always say that I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) I will say, though, go back and watch it. Also, also, they they love the cops too much. They don't love cops. It's very kind of... Not only the cops, but they love law. Oh, that's the whole thing. The whole thing is like... It's like anarchy cannot prevail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Having said that... I mean, obviously, it's a different setting, and I can can appreciate the counter-argument. It just just makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, so, yeah. I think well. they definitely tried to go full the other direction after Next Generation, where they're like, "What if it wasn't just this perfect spaceship where you'd love to live? What if it was yeah, just a yeah, shithole?" Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there was disquiet amongst the writers of Next Generation, and once they mm. got a free hand to like, interesting, do something more interesting, they did something more interesting. Mm. Um, I, I mean, ultimate question though is, who would you rather serve under? And like, dude, Cisco is the dude uh-huh. he is so cool uh-huh. picard is like yeah it would be great serving to picard knows what he's doing he probably wouldn't die except for all those times where they technically did it, it, like he's a little like i don't know it's a little like eh, it's a little not untrustworthy but like there's something going on there cisco is just like he's just gonna get shit done like whatever situation drop him in any situation and he's just the dude picard's kind of like that but he's also a little bit like i don't know yeah maybe maybe this is like an authoritarian street coming out for me <laughs> but like <laughs> i don't know cisco's the dude that's fine. It's like, yeah. Organic yeah. authority figures, I've got nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, yeah, all right. Is that a serious question? Do I need to answer? Yeah, well, yeah Cisco, why not? Yeah, Have you watched yeah. the baseball episode yet? No. Yeah, it's in the final season. Ooh. Um, sounds good. Yeah. Maybe we should watch it for the show. That sounds awesome. I'd yeah, love yeah, to watch we'll baseball episode. <laughs> watch the Star Trek and... Baseball. Mm-hmm. Talk about some baseball. Talk about some baseball. You can educate me on... on uh, yes. On like, that is called a pitch. 24th century baseball. <laughs> Um, I did come across a book that I Although really baseball's died out, it's very sad. Oh. You know this baseball has died. Baseball sort, of, baseball sort of dies out in the in the twenty first century. It does, and that's why like Cisco's being Damn. into baseball. It's like really, it's a oh. really niche thing. Huh. He's like a real baseball nerd. This is why you like it. I He's like a this. real baseball nerd. Ah. Yeah. Um, I came across a book that I came so close to suggesting we read, okay. but yeah, uh, it's just about baseball, so we're not going to do that. Uh-huh. Uh, Boys of Summer, something like that, but it's just all about Jackie Robinson and all that, and I was like, damn, I want to read that book, but probably wouldn't have the time. Uh-huh. It's like, maybe we can just, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It would be cool. Um, 
Anyway, folks, baseball is starting soon, so come back here for all your baseball tips, uh-huh. your all of your uh, your FIPS and your X wobas and mm-hmm. your spin rates and your curve balls and your mm-hmm. fan graphs. Um, and I'll tell and you why what, the Dodgers what, will win the World Series again. <laughs> what names are top contenders for the Cleveland? Uh... Yes. Cleveland baseball team? Yes. I was just reading something yesterday about how they used to be called the Cleveland Naps, which oh. is so good because apparently yeah. there was like a guy What's named a Napoleon. Like a, like a having to sleep. Yeah, having to sleep. <laughs> no, it was just there was a player named Napoleon and they really liked him. Oh, I see. So they called, when he left, they called him the Naps. naps. But it's like, I like just the Naps. Like yeah. bring it back, but have it mean nap. I think yeah. that's really good. <laughs> the Cleveland Naps. Cleveland snooze. The snoozers. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Metabolic rift. I don't know. Close the book on that. That was fun. <laughs> oh ah, the book has been shut um, no more closing thoughts for me any closing thoughts for you Dan um, no I don't think so alright lovely um, this has been the uh, Cap and Cisco Report Hour and Baseball Extravaganza um, my name continues to be and will probably be until I die Jack <laughs> uh, yeah my name is still down <laughs> alright we'll see you next time <laughs> bye bye folks <laughs>